see more of who you are, more of how you've rescued us. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. It's time for our Bible reading now, and we are going to be looking at 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 1 to 23. We um, are not providing Bibles in church. We probably won't do for quite a long time, so please feel free to bring your Bibles to church. I notice one or two people have done that. Um, uh, if you're watching online, uh, then do go and grab a Bible, and then you're able to follow as Henry uh, preaches on the whole theme of captivity. 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 1 to 23. Hear the word of God. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea the son of Ella began to reign in Samaria over Israel, and he reigned nine years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, yet not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Against him came up Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, and Hoshea became his vassal and paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria found treachery in Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to Saul, king of Egypt, and offered no tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria invaded all the land and came to Samaria, and for three years he besieged it. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and on the Habor, the river of Gosan, and in the cities of the Medes. And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt, from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods, and walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel, and in the customs that the kings of Israel had practised. And the people of Israel did secretly against the Lord their God things that were not right. They built for themselves high places in all their towns, from watchtower to fortified city. They set up for themselves pillars and asherim on every high hill and under every green tree. And there they made offerings on all the high places, as the nations did whom the Lord carried away before them. And they did wicked things, provoking the Lord to anger. And they served idols, of which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways, and keep my commandments and my statutes in accordance with all the law that I commanded your fathers, and that I sent to you by my servants the prophets. But they would not listen, but were stubborn, as their fathers had been, who did not believe in the Lord their God. They despised his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and the warnings that he gave them. They went after false idols and became false. And they followed the nations that were around them, concerning whom the Lord had commanded them that they should not do like them. And they abandoned all the commandments of the Lord their God, and made for themselves metal images of two calves. And they made an Asherah, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served Baal. And they burned their sons and their daughters as offerings, and used divination and omens, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel, and removed them out of his sight, None was left but the tribe of Judah only. Judah also did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the customs that Israel had introduced. And the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel and afflicted them and gave them into the hand of plunderers until he had cast them out of his sight. When he had torn Israel from the house of David, 
they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. And Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them commit great sin. The people of Israel walked in all the sins that Jeroboam did. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had spoken by all his prophets, servants the prophets. So Israel was exiled from their own land to Assyria until this day. This is God's word. Are we there? Brilliant. Good evening, everyone. It's great for there to be people in church. We did a service um, this morning and on Tuesday, and doing a service in church with no people in was really, really strange. So it's strange seeing you with face masks on, but it's lovely to see you uh, nevertheless. Um, Let me pray, and then we're going to think about the next part of our Bible overview series, about the grand sweep of the story of the Bible. So let me pray for us, and then we'll talk about the Bible. Um, Father God, um, thank you for your word. Thank you for the story of scripture and how it points to Jesus and how it shows us your faithfulness and also how it shows us our need for you. And God, we we see in the passage we've just read that um, man is sinful, humankind. We are sinful and we fall short of what you ask of us. So help us today to, to see our sinfulness and how we need you but help us to see how good you are and that you are our rescuer and there is good news for those who turn to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've welcomed people who are there over here. Welcome to people who are watching online as well. Thanks for staying with us. Um, It's really good to to be with you all. I want to start by speaking about the Avengers. Um, The Avengers, if you don't know, are Earth's mightiest heroes. Uh, They are... um, the main characters in the Marvel Cinematic Universe or the Marvel Comics, depending on your age. Um, and these guys are, well, they seem unstoppable. Uh, they're mighty, they are strong, they fight off the greatest threats that the, the world has seen, the Chitari and Ultron, for you fans out there. But, well, as we go along the films, it becomes apparent that there is a great enemy who has been behind all the, the smaller enemies. And he comes to the fore in a film called Infinity War. He's called Thanos, and he defeats the Avengers. And at the end of the film, Infinity War, we see the Avengers basically beaten. And you end the film thinking, where's the hope? How are they going to get through this? In our story today, we're thinking about word number six, I think, in our series. The word is captives. And we're going to see the big enemy of Scripture come to the fore. God's people, Israel, have, have, have been through some tough times. They fought off some enemies in God's power. But in our story today, the big enemy of the Bible, it rears its ugly head, and, and we're going to see Israel, Israel go from good to bad. We're going to see the situation look hopeless. We're going to see... Um, questions come about like, how is God going to fulfill his purposes? How is he going to bring salvation for his people? How can humankind have a relationship with God? So I'm going to split our evening into three sections. Um, Together now we're going to think about the captives, we're going to think about uh, the cause, and we're going to think about the cross. The captives, the cause, and the cross. So firstly, captives. Quick recap on where we've been so far in our series. Word number one was creation. God created the world good. He created mankind to live under his good rule. But word number two, the world came under a curse when man rejected God's rule. And we see this curse through the broken relationships between mankind and between mankind and God and the broken relationships between mankind and the world. Word number three was covenant. God did not want to leave the world this way, so he made binding promises. 
to save the world. He outlined his rescue plan. He came to a man called Abraham, and he promised him people, that his offspring would be a great nation. He promised they would dwell in a land, and he promised that they would be blessed and be a blessing to the nations. And then the last two weeks, in words four and five, we've seen God calling a people to himself, which is why we have the word community, a people that he showed how to live for him. And then last week, uh, Tom spoke to us about the word crown. We saw God's people in the land that he had promised them. And God promises them a king that is going to last forever. So this week, we pick up our story at the book of 1 Kings. And things are good in the beginning of 1 Kings. We see King Solomon, David's son, reigning over the kingdom. And he is a wise king. He's been given great wisdom by God, and and things are very good for the nation of Israel. This is known as as Israel's golden age, and it's perhaps the high point in Old Testament history. It's as good as things have been since the Garden of Eden. We see firstly that Israel are a great nation, and they are in the land promised to Abraham. Ellie, I think if we could get a Bible verse on the screen, 1 Kings 4, uh, verses 20 to 21, they say this, Judah and Israel were as many as the sand by the sea. They ate and drank and were happy. Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. So here we see Israel in the promised land, in the land promised to Abraham, and we see them united, serving their king. Now remember last week, David said to God, I want to build you a house. And to cut a long story short, God goes to David, no, I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to establish your kingdom, and one of your offspring is going to build a temple, and his kingdom will last forever. And in 1 Kings 8, we read this. If that can come up on the screen, Ellie, that would be amazing. 1 Kings 8, 20 to 21. Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that he made. For I have risen, this is Solomon speaking, by the way. For I have risen in the place of David, my father, and sit on the throne of Israel, as the Lord promised. And I have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And there I have provided a place for the ark, which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. So Solomon has built the temple. He's built the house that God had promised. And so at this point in the story, you begin to think, Is Solomon the promised king? If you were reading this for the first time, you'd be thinking, is is Solomon the one who's going to fulfill God's promises? Is he the one who God's going to bring salvation through? Is he the king who we've been waiting for since Genesis chapter 3? We even see in 1 Kings chapter 10, God's people being a blessing to the nations. Uh, A lady called the Queen of Sheba visits them, uh, and she's heard of the wisdom and the prosperity of Israel, and she comes to see what it's all about. And in 1 Kings chapter 10, in verses 9 and 10, we see her praising God because of the wisdom of Solomon and the greatness of Israel and all she has seen and heard. God's people are in God's place and they're under God's blessing and being a blessing to the nation. Things are good at this point in the Bible story. Things are very, very good and it shows God's faithfulness to his promises. It shows that he is good and he keeps his word. And Solomon says this in 1 Kings chapter 8, Verse 56, keeping Ellie on her toes. Great work, Ellie. First Kings chapter 8 says, and this is Solomon speaking again, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promise which he spoke by his servant. Things are good. Things are good for Israel right now. But, as we come to see very quickly, this is not the end of the story. There's quite a lot of Bible to read between now uh, and, and the end. And Solomon is a great and wise king, but he's human and he's sinful and he's flawed. And even while things are good for Israel, we begin to see things creeping in that makes you think, okay, perhaps everything's not okay with Solomon. One example is we have a couple of chapters where Solomon is building the temple um, for God and in the middle of this account, there's, there's a few verses that talks about Solomon's palace And Solomon's palace is a lot bigger and a lot grander than God's house. And from that you start to think, okay, is Solomon really got his heart in the right place? Is he really um, following God the way he should be? Another example of of where things start to go wrong for Solomon is 
he, you begin to see that his life doesn't quite match up with um, how God wants his king to live. In Deuteronomy 17, God gives a load of instructions for how he wants his king to live. And we begin to see Solomon not matching up with uh, these, these laws that God has given. One example is God wanted the king to have one wife. Solomon has about 700 wives. Um, not quite, quite sure how he managed that. Um, but there we go. Not quite what God had wanted from his king. We begin to see him go off the rails quite quickly. He falls from his position of wisdom and favor with God and shows that he is a sinful man. And this basically leads to civil war in the kingdom. The kingdom of Israel splits. In 1 Kings chapter 12, um, the northern kingdom, 10 tribes of Israel form the northern kingdom. Confusingly, that's called Israel. And then there's the southern kingdom of Judah. And that happens in approximately 920 BC, if anyone's interested in history. And what happens from then is both kingdoms slip further and further away from God into idolatry. And the rest of the book of Kings, we see them getting further from God, worshipping other gods. We see injustice come in. We see discrimination against the vulnerable and the poor. And throughout this time, God sends warning after warning. He sends his prophets to say, turn back to God, repent, or this judgment is coming. The first 29 chapters of Jeremiah, for instance, are just one big warning to God's people to turn and repent from the way they're living and turn back to God. But Israel don't turn back to God. And what we've just read about in 1 Kings 17 is Israel being invaded and attacked and destroyed by the kingdom of of Assyria, who were the world superpower of the time. They invade Israel and destroy the northern kingdom. And that's the last we hear of the northern kingdom in the Bible. Their descendants are the Samaritans, who are big enemies of the Jews when it comes to New Testament times. And then the southern kingdom of Judah fares no better. They have have better moments. They have moments where you think, oh, perhaps they're turning back to God. But it all ends horribly. In 586 BC, they were invaded by Babylon, who had taken over from Assyria as the world superpower. And they um, destroyed the temple and they carried off um, God's people into exile. I once had a friend who um, was expelled from school. He was a good guy, but he was a bit of a, bit of a terror at school. And I remember really clearly the, the headmaster standing up and addressing the sixth form um, after this, this guy had been expelled. And he was basically like, he said two things. He said, the school has given this person every opportunity to change and, and, to, and to get with the program. But their behavior left the school with no choice but to expel them. In the Bible story, God left Israel, um, Israel left God with no choice. He acted in goodness and patience and warned them again and again and again and again. But they kept rejecting him. This, this shows us something important about God. That God is, is righteous and he will not lower his standards of justice. He will act against Israel and he will act against evil. The story of Israel shows that wicked people that rebellious people will be allowed to prosper at least for a time, but not forever. And this foreshadows a day which is coming where God will judge the whole world. And he'll bring judgment um, on the whole earth. And those who are not found in him, those who are not found, um, those who are found in rebellion to him, will be exiled from his presence. And this is what we all deserve. And that's because we are all captives, as our word is for today. We are all captives of the great enemy of the Bible. We are all sinful. The heart of the problem in Scripture, the heart of the problem in our world and in our lives, is the human heart. That's what I want us to think about next. The cause. We see at this point in our story, Israel is in tatters. We've gone from the high point of the Old Testament to the low point And it seems like all the progress we've made has been undone. The land's been taken away. The people have been scattered. There's no relationship with God anymore, or at least not a great one. 
And 2 Kings, which we've just read, chapter 17, tells us why this happened. In verse 7, which hopefully will come up on the screen, 2 Kings 17, verse 7, says, And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. The cause of Israel's exile was that they had sinned against the Lord who had rescued them from Egypt. God had saved them from slavery. He had given them salvation. He had made them his people. And they said, no thanks God. Shove off God. I'm in charge. No to your rules. I'd rather worship some metal cows and all sorts of other gods. He showed great love and patience to them. But in the way they lived, they pretty much just stuck up two two fingers to God and said, God, don't want anything to do with you. And this attitude is present in every single human heart. You see, Israel's fall is an echo of the first fall, the first fall of humankind. So if we think back to the beginning of our series, to the first two words, creation and curse, Adam and Eve were living in God's place, in a land which he had given them. They were enjoying his blessing. And they threw it all away. They rejected God's rule and blessing. And when that happened, they were exiled. They were removed from God's presence. And that's the way human beings have lived ever since. You see, sin at its core is not just doing some slightly naughty things. And it's not that we do bad things and that makes us sinful. We do wrong things. We, we mess up because we've chosen to live life apart from God, to live separately from him. We've said, shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your rules. It's a handy definition of sin there. And we've chosen to live without him. We've got a children's book at home, and it repeats the line, because of your sin, you can't come in. Because of your sin, you can't come in. Our sin separates us from God's presence. So in that sense, we are all captives. We are all exiles. We are all separated from God's presence. The default state of our heart is to live separately from God. And as we've said before, sin is the big enemy of the Bible. Sin is the big problem in Scripture. It's the reason for our broken relationship with God. It's the reason why Israel got chucked out of the promised land. It's the reason why Solomon could not be the king to save Israel. It's the reason why God's promises ultimately were not fulfilled through Israel. But why is sin actually so bad? Because actually, when we look at things that people say are sinful, when we look around at the world and see people not living for God, we go, that doesn't look too bad. That, that looks okay. That looks quite fun. I've got two reasons for now why sin is such a bad thing. Firstly, because it is hateful to God and it's harmful to ourselves. It's hateful to God and it's harmful to ourselves. Firstly, it's, it's hateful to God. We live in a culture that doesn't like hate. We stand up for injustice. We, we stand up, we rightly stand up against discrimination. We want people to be treated equally. We want people to be accepted. We want people to be treated well. That's something that our culture says, yes, we want this. But the irony is, all of us have treated God with hate and contempt. Some people might argue, I've not treated God with hate and contempt. I mean, I don't really have time for him. I don't really acknowledge he's there. I don't believe in him. But I've not treated him with hate. But as I've thought about it this week, I actually reckon that's probably the worst way we can treat God. You see, God gave us life. He, 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 he made us, and he wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to call us. He wants us to call him Father. I've got a little daughter, and she's pretty young. And I helped to bring her into the world. I did less than my wife did, but I helped. And the worst thing she could possibly do to me is not to shout and scream at me, is not to hurl abuse at me, but is to say, say when she's older, is to say, Dad, I don't want a relationship with you. I don't want anything to do with you. I don't even want to call you father. Get out of my life. That's the worst thing she could do to me. That's the most hateful thing my daughter could do to me. And actually, the irony is, friends, that we have all treated God like this. We have all said, shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your rules. We've said, God, I don't want anything to do with you. 
I want to live life my way. And I want to put it to you that that is hateful towards God. And that's one reason why sin is serious. The second reason is because it's harmful to us. Sin is harmful to us. When we uh, got Poppy baptized, we were given a plant by my brother. Um, fairly decent present. Um, but the thing is, I'm not very good with plants and green things. And I forgot to plant the plant. It was in, in my living room, in a pot, but no soil. My mum came over to our house, and she said, you need to plant the plant, otherwise it's going to die. And in my head, I was thinking, yeah, I probably need to plant it, but it, but it looks okay. It look, there's leaves, it's fairly green, it's looking okay. But the thing was, the plant was dying. It wasn't connected to the soil and the nutrients and whatever else a plant needs. It wasn't connected, so even though it looked good on the outside, it was dying. Many people we see walking around, many of us look fine, we look okay, look like we're doing all right, but the thing is we are all temporary. We are all dying. And death is a result of our sin. And because we've chosen to live life disconnected from the source of life, we've chosen to live life disconnected from God. The penalty for that is, is death. The wages of sin is death. And if we go on choosing to live life separately from God, there is no hope for us when we die. So sin is hateful to God and harmful to us. And it's the big problem of the Bible story and it's the big problem in our world today. So what's the solution? What's the solution for sin? Maybe we can just sweep it under the carpet Forget it ever happened. Fresh start. Or perhaps we need uh, more education. We need to teach people how to live better. Some people might say we need harsher punishments or warnings. That might work. Some people might say we need just self-improvement. We need to do better. We need to improve ourselves. We need to be more religious maybe. But the story of Israel shows us that a bigger rescue is needed, a deeper rescue is needed to deal with the problem of sin. We need more than just fresh starts sweeping under the carpet because I guess that's, in a way, that's what Canaan was, this land. It was a fresh start for Israel. But even with that, they kept on sinning. We need more than, than clear instructions. We need more than education. You see, Israel had the law they had as clear instructions as you can get from God. They had this direct communication of God. Here's how to live. Here's how to please me. And they kept on sinning. We need more than firm punishments. Israel had so many warnings. If you read the Old Testament, turn to God or this is going to happen. Turn to God or this is going to happen. They still kept on sinning. And we need more than just religious good works. Israel had so many religious things to do. They had priests. They had sacrifices. They had the tabernacle. They still kept on sinning. The point is, if Israel, who had all of this stuff to help them to live for God, if they did not treat God rightly, well then, no one is righteous. No one can live for God. No one's got a chance in solving the problem of sin. A deeper rescue is needed. Spiritually, the human race is exiled from God. We are, we are sinners, we are orphans, we are captives. A deeper rescue is needed. And that's why we celebrate the cross. That's why we sing about our rescue from Jesus Christ. As we, as, we, as we come into land, as we finish our time thinking about God's word, let's think about the cross. So we've talked about sin and the judgment that it deserve, deserve, deserves and how because of our sin we are separated from God and can't be in a relationship with him. But the beauty of the Bible story is that even though it was humans that caused the offense, it's God who sets about to bring reconciliation. Even though it was human beings who said, God, I don't want anything to do with you. I don't even think, gonna, I'm just not gonna even, I'm gonna live like you do not exist. God says, I'm gonna chase you down. I'm gonna find you. I'm gonna save you. And even though it's human beings that deserved to be punished, God himself took the punishment we deserve. You see, Jesus Christ left his home. He became an exile. He became 
a wanderer. He became an outcast. He left his home in heaven and he spent his life being rejected by the people of earth. It says in the, John chapter 1 verse 10, he says, He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his people did not receive him. Jesus became an exile on earth and he experienced the ultimate exile on the cross. He was treated like the ultimate criminal. Crucifixions are for the worst of the worst. And he received the ultimate exile from God. On the cross, the punishment and separation that we should experience was placed onto Jesus. And the favor and delight that he had experienced from God from all eternity was withdrawn from him and unleashed upon him was the full weight of human sin and rebellion. Which is why we sing in Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness who was scorned by the ones he came to save. But on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, the death of Christ, I live. Jesus died, so I might live. He was cast out, so I might be brought in. He was rejected and forsaken by his Father on the cross, so that all who believed in him, all that received his name, he gives the right to become children of God. If you believe in his name, if you've received his name, his gift of salvation, you are no longer an exile. You are no longer a stranger. You are no longer a captive. You are a child of God. I want to finish by just looking at a verse from Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 tells, paints a brilliant and beautiful picture, one of the most beautiful pictures in the Bible of how we've been brought back into a relationship with God. How we go from being captives to being his children. Maybe we can have Ephesians 2, 12 to 13 on the screen. Brilliant. Paul says to the Ephesians, remember that you were at that time, that time when we didn't believe in Christ, that time when we didn't accept him. At that time, we were separate from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We once, when we didn't believe in Christ, had no hope. We were without God in the world. We were far off. We were exiles. But we have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. We're about to sing this song, and it says, We were sinners. We were orphans. We were looking for a home. We were lost, and we were broken, wandering alone. But looking down at our condition, God sent his Son to change our fate. Though we were hopelessly imprisoned, he came to take our place. Glory to the name of Jesus. Glory to the only name that saves. Ransomed the captives. Ransom the captives. Your name is matchless. Let me pray and then we'll sing. Jesus, thank you that you became an exile. You became a, you left your home to seek out the lost You left your home to seek out us. You're the kind of God that leaves the 99 sheep on the hill to go and find the one sheep that is lost. And when you find that sheep, there is a party in heaven. You are a good God who loves to welcome sinful people into his family. And God, we acknowledge that we have messed up. We are, our default setting is to say to you, God, we don't want anything to do with you. But God, thank you that you have chased us down and you've set us free from captivity. You've set us free from our sin. Glory to the name of Jesus. Glory to the only name that saves. Ransom the captives. Your name is matchless. Amen.